All right. Thanks, everyone. Hi, I'm Megan. I'm the Utah State University Forestry Extension Educator. That's a mouthful, but part of my job is putting on these Learn at Lunch webinars monthly. And each month, I'm part of what I really enjoy is picking interesting speakers um, that can inform me and our audience about new tools um, and, and new research and what's going on in the forestry um, extension world. So today we have Randy Swati, who is from the Nature Conservancy, is going to join us. Um, but first, I'd like to draw your attention to our next webinar. Um, that'll be on October 4th, and um, it's, we'll be talking about cross-laminated timber in the West and how this new building technology is informing design, construction, and industry. Uh, we also have a Restoring the West conference. This conference is in the 11th year, I believe, and it happens right here in Logan on the Utah State University campus. And this year we're talking about climate, disturbance, and restoration in the Intermountain West. So if you're in the area, we'd love to have you for that um, conference. And then November 30th, we'll be talking about soil compaction in urban trees, and uh, we'd love to have you for that webinar as well. So those are just a couple things for your calendar. Um, so today, we're going, like I said, we'll be um, joined by Randy Swati. Randy joined Landfire full time in 2007. He's covered a variety of bases, including working to improve forest certification standards, participating in conservation area planning, serving on the Conservancy's forest management SOP team, and contributing to global fire assessment. He develops vegetation models and applies land fire products within and outside of the Nature Conservancy. He facilitates workshops and seminars on the use of land fire data and products, and he's one of the leaders on the Biophysical Settings Review Project. He grew up in Little Rock. He earned both his bachelor's and master's degree at NAU University in Flagstaff, and he splits his time between Marquette, Michigan, and Evanston, Illinois, and today he's joining us from Evanston. So thanks again, Randy. Thanks, Jeannie, for joining us, um, and I look forward to your talk. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Megan, Mark, and Jeannie for helping to put this on. I've been looking forward to this, um, and I hope it's useful for you. I'll do my best to make it useful, and if it's not, send complaints to landfire at tnc.org, the complaint line. All right, so today I'll be going through those four bullets you see there, and I want to also introduce our team. So we're the Nature Conservancy's land fire team. We're a part of a larger project team um, that includes USGS staff, Forest Service staff, and other contractors. You see Jim Smith on the left in Florida, Corey Blankenship, our fire ecologist, myself, Sarah Hagen is our GIS analyst. Kim Hall is on our team. She's a climate change scientist. And Jeannie, you probably saw in the window earlier, and she's on your far right. So I have the text there that says my land fire story. So as um, Megan mentioned, I came out of Northern Arizona University. I moved to Michigan, and I started working with industrial landowners there, such as Mead West Vaco International Paper. And we had a problem. We could not assess vegetation across their ownerships. They had great data sets, but they wouldn't speak to each other. And also, a familiar story, we didn't have any data on the non-industrial um, private landowners in Michigan. We also didn't have um, a way to compile the data sets that we had. So it made doing any sort of landscape assessment almost impossible. Then I heard about this thing called land fire. And it's a large government project that aims to do just that, to provide data sets to help you assess your landscapes. So we'll be going over that today. So wait, what's in this for me? You gotta be asking, and I hope you'll ask that through the whole presentation and be thinking opportunistically, what can I do with this stuff? Um, I'll go over some specific examples to prompt you, but people are doing, prescribed fire assessments on their landscapes. They're using it for Forest Stewardship Council certification. Tons of wildlife habitat modeling papers coming out and um, using land fire data. Scenario modeling and collaborative learning. So a lot of you probably work on landscapes where people don't agree what should be done. Um, the modeling that we do is fairly simple and can be used in a stakeholder setting to to kind of proceed with a collaborative learning approach, which was pioneered, I believe, at Utah State, actually, and Oregon State as well. 
Um, then also, I think at Landfire serves as a great teaching tool, whether you're teaching ecology, modeling, or GIS. So hopefully you'll be thinking about those things as we go through our talk today. So here's sort of the official verbiage about Landfire. And I like it. I like the word innovative. We're always trying to grow and improve. I like the word vegetation. Even though it's called land fire, it's really about vegetation. Um, it's also consistent, meaning that the way we map things in the West is, is, is similar to the way we map things in the East in terms of methodology. So if you're working across the Great Lakes or across the Rockies, you can feel pretty good that the data sets um, that represent Montana are priests were developed similarly to data sets in Wisconsin or Wyoming, I meant to say. So um, I'm going to be going over the aspatial models and descriptions, um, and I'm going to be talking about some of the spatial data sets. And what I want you to remember, though, from this slide is it's more than just this toolbox thing. It's a, it's a vibrant community. Um, we have brilliant people on the Landfire program, they're doing amazing things, for example, to incorporate LIDAR data into Landfire. But we also have you all that are out there looking at the data, providing feedback, learning how to hack the models, how to make things better. So it's a really great community. And I want you to remember that as well. It's not just a bunch of GIS data. It's not just billions of pixels. All right, so this model thing. Um, while you probably think of, um, you know, running away, or you probably don't think of runway models when you think of models, especially not me on the runway. Um, but, you know, it's really fun to model. And I learned that working with Landfire data. And so what happened was the Nature Conservancy got a cooperative agreement to describe and model reference conditions for the ecosystems of the U.S. And this idea of reference conditions is worth several beverages together. If you see me, let's talk about what that means in more detail. And how you feel about reference conditions. But to Landfire, it's basically trying to represent how our ecosystems looked and worked prior to European settlement. We tried to factor in natural disturbance regimes, um, including fire, beaver, herbivory, wind throw. I'll go into those details in a moment. But we're not looking at climate change. We're not giving you a prescription for your future. And we're also not... Um, trying to tell you exactly what you need to do. We're helping provide a baseline for you to learn about your ecosystems. And often, you know, that's another conversation point. You know, with climate change, we might think the reference conditions aren't as valid, but a lot of times they are, and they provide us, provide us insights as to what might happen in the future. And the cool thing about these reference conditions is that we described geographic range, disturbance, biophysical indicators that told us where these ecosystems or BPSs, biophysical settings, would have been. These descriptions have the dominant species, information on vegetation and literature. And, you know, you can get a PDF file of these. I'll show you how in a moment. Or you can get a monster database and query these things yourself if you're so inclined. But to me, the greatest thing about these um, biophysical settings are their succession classes. You know, we're not trying to represent just a static view of ecosystems. We know they change over time in response to disturbances. So we try to capture that. And I'm going to go into that a fair bit. But how we did all this was that we held hundreds, not hundreds, dozens of workshops with hundreds of experts who looked at our list of ecosystems, picked one, and then dug in and started typing out the indicators or the parameters you see on the screen. And then they even got into the modeling. So we had hundreds of people exposed to modeling. I don't know if it was contagious or not, but we hope so. So as I mentioned, in addition to all those basic ecosystem description bits, we broke each biophysical setting or BPS, I'll probably say BPS a fair bet, into up to five succession classes, A, B, C, D, and E. Some biophysical settings had less than that, but five was the max. The next few slides will be the same as this, and I'll have different parts circled of these succession class descriptions. 
So here I have circled the indicator species. So these are species that sort of typify this succession class, and they're in a, the code that's used by plants.gov. It's a USDA website. For example, for example, POTR5 is quaking ap aspen. Um, SYOR2 is mountain snowberry. So again, you can go to the plants website, type in those codes and get their scientific name or common name. But each succession class has indicator species. Also, so this is an important part of the succession class concept. You know, these succession classes within e any BPS moved around over time. So Landfire never tried to map where the succession classes were historically. In 1800, succession class B may have been in one place. In 1700, it may have been in another. However, we use these rules to map succession classes on the landscape today so that we can make a comparison of how much of each succession class is out there on the landscape compared to what we modeled that would have been there historically. So if a mapper saw this Aspen biophysical setting, saw a pixel of that, and then saw that currently we had, say, 60% canopy cover for that pixel, and the trees were between 5.1 meters and 10 meters, they would stamp that pixel with a succession class B. So it's pretty elegant. Um, there are more complex ways to do it, but for the whole country, I think this was a pretty neat way to accomplish this. Each succession class also has a text description that will often have disturbance information. The, 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 the complete bit of disturbance information would be captured in the models, which I'll show you in a moment, but most authors also wrote some text for the ease of the user. All right. Now I've mentioned modeling, and the reason we modeled was, um, I would say threefold. One was to just document the disturbances. Two was to learn especially about the fire disturbances so we can map those. Then also we wanted to know how much of each succession class would have been on the landscape historically. So as you might imagine in the fire adapted ecosystems that have um, frequent surface fire, um, you would have most of the landscape in the open canopy succession classes. Here you see 40%. I'm circling it with my finger. You probably can't see that, but it's circled in red for you. Um, for this Aspen BPS, somewhere out west, I don't remember where, we modeled based on natural disturbance regimes that there would be 40% of class B. All right, how do we do that? we used vegetation dynamics development tool. That was in the past. We've transferred our work over to STSIM, State and Transition Simulator. All right, so we, we can use the same databases from VDDT to run STSIM, which is a bit more robust and user-friendly. So in our workshops or when we model it at home, you click on the green boxes and you'll get a table with the natural disturbance regimes. So you can go in and alter those. You can say, ah, oh, I think um, surface fire would have occurred in class A more often, and you can alter that. Or if you want to play with models for the current situation, you might turn off all fire because we're effectively um, suppressing most fires. You might want to throw in logging or invasives or um, um, modern grazing regimes. But the models developed for land fire just have natural historic disturbance regimes. So here's a, a schematic of how this works. For a north central interior dry music oak forest and woodland, this was developed by Region 9 Forest Service ecologist Dr. Greg Nowacki. And it's a pretty robust model. And what I've got here are just some of the disturbances. What you'll see is you have the prairie. Only 2% of this biophysical setting would have been in prairie, according to Greg and the literature he mined for this. Um, after five years of prairie, if that particular cell is not burned or grazed or has some other disturbance, it will succeed to savanna. That cell will stay in savanna for up to, 50, up to the 50 year mark. Then it'll succeed the woodland. Those are the black lines. The red lines are just some of the disturbances to show you how it works. 
So roughly every 10 years, um, Greg modeled that there would be um, a surface fire in the Savannah succession class. And that would just keep that particular succession class open. It would keep it from succeeding to the woodland. So um, it's fairly elegant, fairly simple to use. And once we got all the disturbance parameters in there, we would hit the model, we would hit go, we would run it for a thousand years and get the percentages that you see here. Importantly, this particular model was developed for a large part of the Eastern United States. Right now, um, we're working to review all of our biophysical settings, descriptions, and models. And I got some feedback the other day um, suggesting that the 59% in the Oak Forest succession class is probably too high for the mid part of the country, which I totally agree with. Um, so we're probably going to go in and increase the, the fire rates. And I expect that we'll get less of that Oak Forest succession class and more of the woodland. So we're looking for literature for help in um, updating these models. All right, so to get the model bundles, for lack of a better term, you go to landfire.gov, click on the vegetation button at the top, and start drilling down. We're not going to make you remember all this. We'll send you the links. But um, you can do a couple things. You can click on that map below in a certain map zone and get a PDF file with all the descriptions, which can be pretty massive. For Michigan, for example, I think there's between two and 300 pages of descriptive material. You can also download the databases to run the models, or if you want to do queries of all the descriptions or a subset, you can get the um, compiled description databases that you see on the, the left of that table there. So with that, I wanted to stop for a minute um, and see if there are any questions that Mark or Megan want to pass along as they've been following the chat. I have not. Hey, Randy, I don't see any questions yet. Oh, we got one. So I will just, is it best for me to just read it to you? Sure, sure. Okay, so Laura asked, she's curious if any range specialists were included in the original VDT. BPS modeling. For instance, Jim Cagney, BLM Wyoming, and others have vested lots of effort developing state and transition models for sagebrush, et cetera. Ah, great question, Laura. Um, yes, um, we, we tried to engage as many experts as we could, though I, I miss several in my area, I know. Um, in the Great Lakes, I miss several experts that I should have engaged with. So we're always looking for more people to bring into this next round of reviews. Um, also, um, you guys probably all know that, well, I'm guessing, Laura, you were referring to some of the um, ecological site description state and transition models. You may have been referring to that. And we are working with the NRCS to form a partnership where we can learn from their state and transition modeling and they can learn from ours. So um, send me a note later if you want to talk more about ecological site descriptions and land fire. But, but great question, Laura. And I've I've written down Jim Cagney's name, and I'll, I'll, I'll try to contact him and find out um, if he's interested in helping us out. Great point. And then Rob asked another one. Um, he has an example. Indicator species include a genus Ribes. How often are these resolved down to the species? I would say most of the time. Um, it's interesting you saw that. that. That definitely happens. And there are some codes that are mistakes. We find those occasionally. But there are... Um, I think almost 2,000 plant species in that database that were used, and most of them are resolved to species, but, but not all, so we're hoping to improve that going forward. I'm just kind of flabbergasted that this data is, is like free and available, so it's, it's actually really free and available to anybody that wants to download it? It is, it is. Um, I wish I could throw on the word like totally easy, um, we're working all the time to make it easier, but we have dozens of spatial data sets. And um, right now we have roughly at 1,700 models and descriptions. So we're always working to make it easier for the users. But um, if you ever have questions, that's, that's what our team is paid to do is to help users, you know, get the data. But it is definitely free. Well, it's, it's your tax dollars at work. Great. I don't think I see any other questions. All right. Well, thanks for those great questions. And with that, I'm going to move on to some of the spatial data sets. Oh, 
before I do that, I'm going to prime, prime the pump for you um, in, in terms of using those biophysical settings. Um, I don't know how many of you guys deal with um, Forest Stewardship Council certification, but being a forestry crew, I thought this might be um, of interest to you. Um, if you're familiar with FSC certification, you might think that, that I wrote Principle 6 or part of it, especially Criteria 6. It's, it's incredible how well Landfire fits that the indicators under that criteria. So we can create these graphs fairly easily that that help you assess current versus historic succession classes. And the descriptions have the disturbance information. So principle six criteria six calls for this exactly. So I I just say impress your auditor next time with some cool graphs like this. Um, give me a buzz. I'd love to to learn about your landscape and help you with that. Um, there are dozens of uses on Google Scholar of people using the biophysical settings. Um, Paulgo et al. in Oregon and Washington used landfire models plus their own spatial data sets to assess restoration needs across Washington and Oregon. They did an amazing job um, learning about landfire, hacking the models to better fit their landscape, then crosswalking their local data sets to the land fire breaks. Um, so it's, it's a really great paper that we can share with you. It's in forest ecology and management. And it's really sophisticated, but, but elegant as well with great graphics such as the one you see here. Um, and then, you know, when I go to high schools or college ecology classes or landscape ecology classes, um, you know, this is a great place to start learning about how ecosystems work. I know there are tons of textbooks out there, but um, disturbance and succession drive a lot of our terrestrial ecology. So turn to land fire if you don't have other sources of information for your area. Um, it's pretty accessible and it's oftentimes real wit, re, well written, excuse me, and our experts were, were all amazing that contributed. So to summarize, these models represent how the ecosystems of the U.S. worked prior to major European settlement. There's two parts, as you've gleaned. There's the, the model um, that is, you know, in modeling software that you can interact with. Then there's this, the description, which helps you to interpret and understand the model. As you'll see in a moment, the biophysical settings, models, and descriptions are linked to several spatial data sets, which you may have heard of. Um, they're, they're more commonly used than the models. Again, I have to say this, um, it's not a prescription for how things should be today or tomorrow. Um, I often get red flags that go off, you know, when you, when you present these graphs. Um, we're helping you set context and understand your landscape. We're not telling you what to do. Then the models can be modified. Uh, it may sound scary, but it's not that hard. I'm sure in an hour I could get you up and running playing with those models. And I'm always happy to do that. So as I mentioned before, most people, I think, when they, they hear about landfire, they think of the, the maps or the spatial data. And as Megan mentioned earlier, they're free. They're, they're really amazing in that they cover all lands. They're not just Forest Service lands, not just Nature Conservancy lands. Um, updated every two years. And it's, I, I should have put bold and flashing with your help. You know, we mine satellite imagery and all the government disturbance databases for information help us update the data sets but whenever you have disturbances that you can send us that would be so helpful the data sets play well with others and I should say plays well with other land fire data sets um, GIS people on the phone know what it's like to mash different data sets together from different sources which can be a challenge but within land fire all the data sets speak to each other that's the pixels line up the everything's crosswalked already it's it's really um, a pleasure to work with once you get used to working with rasters and you get started with it. Um, I'll say also the, the little speech here, it's designed for large scale use. What happens oftentimes is people fall prey to my favorite pixel syndrome where I show them the data, they go to where they met their spouse, they love that place. They say, ah, oh, land fire, you know, it was, it's pine, it's not oak. And then they ditch the data set. I see it happen a fair bit. And I, I bet that GIS people are nodding their heads. It's my favorite pixel syndrome. Don't fall prey to that. Landfire is designed for watershed scale work. 
um, it's, it's designed for large areas. So it may be a little confusing. I say it's good for Forest Stewardship Council certification. And what I mean specifically is that it's not for managing your stands. It's for looking across the landscape as, as, as designed or, or called for in Principle 6. So thanks for that. I had to give you the scale lecture. Um, Landfire delivers dozens of data sets, and I'm going to focus on a few. Here I've highlighted some of the historic data sets, such as environmental site potential. That would be analogous to a climax situation, artificial, but it's the building block for some of our other data sets. And then we have multiple fire, historic fire regime data sets and the biophysical settings that you'll see next. So um, I didn't go in and recolor this. It looks a little pink. Um, sorry about that, Utah. But what this is are the biophysical settings for Utah. And what it is is imagine um, sort of a potential natural vegetation with disturbance on top, right? We're not trying to map climax ecosystems here, but we are trying to map systems. So if a pixel is labeled um, ponderosa pine woodland and forest, that particular pixel may have had, you know, ponderosa pine savanna in it at one time. It may have had ponderosa pine woodland at one time or any of the succession classes that would have been modeled for that ponderosa pine biophysical setting. So it's not just a snapshot, and it's not just potential natural veg. So it's, it's kind of a neat concept, but it's one that um, I don't run across very commonly. So if you have questions about it, let me know. We'll dig into it together. The mean fire return interval data set is really cool. It's fun. It's basically an attribute of the biophysical settings data set. So for each biophysical setting, we have a composite fire return interval, a composite of surface, mixed, and replacement fires, and a composite of all those across the succession classes that make up that biophysical setting. Here in green, you see um, vegetation that would have had a longer fire return interval. And my presumption is that that's because the fuels were relatively sparse, the vegetation was sparse. Um, curious about what you think on that as well. So people use these spatial data sets for a lot of things. One, they dig into fire needs assessments. <laughs> Excuse me. There are an, uh, a growing number of fire needs assessments, um, including this one in Wisconsin. There was one just completed in Illinois. Um, a shout out to my Hiawatha National Forest friends. We're currently working on a, a fuels assessment for their national forest and immediately surrounding areas so they can figure out what to do where and when, prioritizing their work. Um, it's based off the B BPS data sets and their own expertise and their own information. So it's not just land fire, it's always land fire plus tons of other data. Um, I promised that we would, I would use the word arbuscular. And so here you go. Um, mycorrhizae are relationships between plants and soil fungi, some of you may know. To oversimplify this, the fungi provide nutrients and water and are supported by plant carbohydrates. Super oversimplification. They make the world go round. Um, most plant families have these relationships, and some plants will not survive the maturity without them. So, yeah, they run the world. Um, colleagues and I linked mycorrhizal types to the dominant plant species within each BPS, and then compile those to give each BPS a community label like you see here. Then we stamped on top of that the ag and urban um, from the land fire existing vegetation type data set to come up with an estimate of the mycorrhizae, mycorrhizal communities that have been lost um, on the landscape. Of course, this is incomplete. We didn't go into exotics. You know, we didn't go into a lot super detail, but we were able to make maps of the whole United States looking at potential mycorrhizal communities that would have been on the landscape historically. Um, all right, so I see a small typo. If you would, on the very top, scratch out, erase historic on the very top. Um, the bold text that's in italics is right. These are some of the current data sets that are out there. 
I'm going to focus on the existing vegetation type. Um, and, but you see there's fuel and there are several other data sets as well. Okay, existing vegetation type, it is what it is. There are 139 types in Utah when you look at the finest scale um, labeling of the maps. And then if you look at the coarsest attribute in the EVT data set, you'll get the physiognomy, which I had to look up, which means general form. This is clipped for Utah. Um, no surprise, most of Utah is shrubland followed by coniferous vegetation. So researchers use, the, use this to constrain their, their work. So maybe they want to constrain their modeling to just shrublands. They would use the EVT data to, to, to do that. Existing vegetation cover, um, it's, uh, the pixels first mapped as herbaceous shrub or tree, and then it's mapped with a percentage of cover. What I want to clarify here is that a pixel does not get multiple designations. A pixel does not get the percent herbaceous, percent shrub, percent tree within that pixel. Each pixel just gets one of these labels. As I was looking at that, I'm like, that could be confusing. It would be really cool if we did all that, but we don't. Existing vegetation height, um, it, you see it there. The forests are mapped in green. The darker green means taller trees. Um, again, a, a really fascinating data set to, to drill into. I love touring the country via these data sets. All right, I'm switching the um, geography on you. Um, and I kind of shudder when I see this because this is the land fire disturbance data from 99 to 2010. And those of you in the South know what this is. It's Winthrow, it's tornadoes. It makes me want to do the duck and tuck in my basement when I see this. Um, Really, really amazing. So land fire maps disturbance every year. And those purple lines are tornadoes, presumably. The dark kind of gray is logging and the red is fire. So a lot of fire, a lot of disturbance in the southeast. Um, some folks that, that never travel there may not realize how much disturbance there is in the southeast. It's incredible. All right, so use. Um, we all want to know where cryptic zooids live, right? So um, folks at the University of California, Pennsylvania, um, led by Thomas Mueller, developed a tutorial for their students where they use land fire existing vegetation type, height, and cover data to map um, Sasquatch habitat out west. Incredible. Just a great teaching tool. Um, lots of credit goes to Kelsey O'Pry. She put this together as a student. And she also translated it into Spanish. Amazing effort. And if you're wanting to teach raster data set work, um, Landfire is a great place to start. And this tutorial is really amazing. It's fun to go through and think about Sasquatch. Um, there, there are tons of uses out there. One of my favorites is connecting fire and water. So, um, Miller and tons of other people are using land fire data to model post-fire erosion risk out west. As you know, a huge issue, there's a fire followed by mudslides that um, is a real threat to municipal water out west and not to mention biodiversity in the streams. So um, check out this water erosion prediction project. If you Google that, you can download their tool. So our hope is this, you know, you'll, you'll see some use of land fire in your work, then you'll look at it and you'll provide us feedback. You'll say, man, that's really great for my area. Or you'll say, you know what, why don't we get um, Jim in the rangelands to look at your models? I think they're off a little bit. Let's improve those. So hit me up for a map. You know, I can, I can show you how to make a map, teach a man to fish, or I can um, make maps for you <laughs> if they're not too complicated. Um, and if they're complicated, we'll work together to make sure you get them. But that's the easiest thing to do. Throw in a map in your next document. Um, check it out. Give it a look. So land fire plus users equal better products. We depend on you guys for feedback. Right now, we're re reviewing those BPS bundles. Um, call me. Let's do a WebEx. Let's do a Skype. And let's review a document together. Or if you'd rather just work at home without me, that's fine. Go to landfirereview.org and get the Word documents there of the ecosystems you're interested in. Go into track changes, send us the document back. And we are going to start going through the changes this fall. So I want to let you know if you've provided us reviews so far, 
thanks a million. And you may not have heard from us, but we're going to start looking at those reviews in the fall and we may contact you then. So we do appreciate your reviews if you've done them and if you're going to do them and we, we're not ignoring you. We just are collecting reviews now. Um, also, you can submit plot or polygon data. That goes directly into our update process. The Landfire existing data sets are updated every two years, which is incredible. Again, using satellite imagery, government databases of disturbances, and user submitted information. So landfire.gov has the link for contributing data. And with that, I'm gonna stop here. You guys are all probably breathing a sigh of relief and um, you can check out these links of how to find us, but most importantly, landfire at tnc.org. And I, I'm happy to take questions, discussion. Um, we'd really like to interact with you guys, so fire away. I have a basic question, and Maybe. then I have, we have two questions waiting. How, what size, how, how much land does a pixel represent? I should probably know this, but I don't. No, no problem. It's 30 meters by 30 meters. Okay. <clears throat> and, All right. Um, that does not mean you go in and you look at each 30 meter pixel, but that's the resolution of the data. Okay. Travis Newman has a question. I'm curious about quality control and validation. How accurate are these data sets? Also curious about how soils are incorporated into your mapping data. Okay, great questions. I'm gonna work backwards. Um, so you may remember I said that we try to use consistent methods to map across the country so that you can compare biophysical settings and Wisconsin to Minnesota and not have to worry about methods changes from Wisconsin to Minnesota. Um, what we found as we moved from west to east is that as you might imagine, elevation, slope, and aspect became a little less important and soils became more important for those biophysical settings. So we did use soils to some example to map biophysical settings in the west. We used them a lot more in the east. And I predict that as we start a remap process, which is not just refreshing the data, totally remapping the data, we used soils even more and there's some great new data sets such as the soil fertility indices and the soil drainage index um, index and index to make indices but we're going to try to use those in places so if you can provide us rule sets of what vegetation goes with which soils that really helps um, then in terms of quality uh, what we do is we withhold so let me say that uh, the existing vegetation data sets work sort of like this. We have tens of thousands of plots that we've gathered across the country. And we use those to train our modeling software to map everything out. So we withhold some of those plots and we use those to do quality assessment. You can go to landfire.gov and download those. I'll probably sound like a politician, but it's, it's so landscape to landscape dependent and scale dependent that you, you kind of need to check it out for yourselves. I can tell you that in some places, Landfire is amazing. It's just like, wow, how did they get that? How did they get that? In some places, people don't use it. They have their own local data sets that are better and Landfire has room to improve. Um, so it's, it's highly variable. So if you want to explore your landscape, let me know. Again, I don't mean to, to, to punt on you, but it's really hard to give an exact answer. Do I have access to step in here for just a second? Sure, go ahead. Okay, thanks. Um, I wonder, this is Jeannie, and I want to point out the Conservation Gateway address. We just caught a glitch in that this morning. So if you are going to write, or if you're going to click on that one, here's the address really, http colon, or yeah, colon slash slash nature.ly slash landfire, not dot landfire. So please make that correction. And then also that email landfire at tnc.org. If you're not <laughs> writing Randy directly at our swati at tnc.org, you can always send a mail to landfire at tnc.org. I monitor that and we pick up mail every day and we will put uh, your request or conversation or comments or whatever in front of the people who need to see them. So um, just wanted to give you a heads up on that. Thanks, Jeannie. Thanks, Jeannie. Um, I found the Q&A screen. So oh, wow. Megan, not to take your job away, but um, no. 
Do I, I don't know if you can all see this. You probably can, but Pat Terletsky asked a couple of great questions. Um, in trying to clarify myself, I probably made things more confusing. His first question is, um, can you clarify what you meant about cover layer, that each pixel gets uh, for shrub or herbaceous cover? So first, Lamfire will give a pixel a forest shrub or herb designation. And if you go into the cover layer and use that attribute for mapping, you could just map whether pixels are forest shrub or herbaceous. Then Lamfire also gives each pixel a percent cover for that type. All right. So if a pixel is labeled as forest 10 to 20 percent, that means that the dominant vegetation is the forest in terms of the canopy and um, or the highest vegetation and it's got 10 to 20 percent canopy closure. It's a bit confusing. I encourage you to look into the metadata, but um, in regards to the next question, Pat asked, is, is there not a layer of forest, a layer of shrub, a layer of herbaceous? No, not so much. They're all in the cover data. So you would go in and use the, the attribute that just has shrub, herbaceous, or forest and, and make your map based on that. And if you need to select those types and GIS, you can to make those three data sets. And I could be wrong too. Um, Landfire is huge, so there there may be those those data sets out there. But that's my understanding right now. Um, Molly asks a great question. Do you have access to the assessment inventory and monitoring data that's collected by the BLM and other government agencies? My guess is yes, but I'm writing myself a note to double check. I believe we have an agreement with the Forest Service to use the FIA data keeping the confidentiality um, intact. In and I believe that we're, we're, we have, you know, the BLM and all the other government data sets um, that we mine and use for our mapping. But I'm going to double check on that. So thanks, Molly. Any other questions or comments? I'm not sure if we got to the one that Travis asked. You probably is the very first question in the Q&A about quality control and validation. Randy, are you seeing that? Um, I don't see that at the moment. It looks like, yeah, I tried to answer it. Okay. Yeah, I don't see it, but anyways, I, oh. So Laura, <clears throat> Laura Duran asked, other data sources are the, or she didn't ask, other data sources are the state natural heritage program, so that's a good, good point. Definitely, thank you for that. You see me taking notes to, you know, it's, um, it's embarrassing that I don't ha always have solid answers, but again, Landfire is big and I, I don't always have the answers. So I'm going to check into that too. How big is your Landfire team, Randy? Like uh, clearly you're not the only one working on it at TNC. Sure. Um, that's another one I don't have the, the perfect answer for, but our team with the Nature Conservancy is um, six people, a couple working half time with us. Then, but the larger land fire program, I think it's probably 40 or 50. Jeannie, do you have an idea on that? Yeah, I think you're about right in the 40 range. And if you go to landfire.gov about us and click on the team, you'll get to see photos and bios of every one of the land fire members. And that's across all the agency partners. Um, our team of six is the Nature Conservancy's team. Uh, everyone else involved is from a variety of government agencies. So go to landfire.gov about us and you'll get the full list. Oh, Travis asked another great question and I've always wanted to do this. Um, do you guys label mapping data with uncertainties? Not that I know of. I've always wanted to have like a confidence-ometer on those biophysical settings models. Um, and honestly, you know, with that sort of thing, I look at who did the modeling. Um, you know, it is what it is. Some people are more experts than others, and a lot of those times they'll admit that. I look at the literature, and I look at how solid their disturbance information is. But no, we do not, um, we do not address uncertainty in the data sets. Randy, I'm curious about specific tools with regard to processing data. Are you guys using 
Esri or some open source things or what specific tools and things are used and actually process and work with this, with this data? Yeah, great question. So the, the data sets are delivered in a couple ways. One is, um, is Esri grids. So I think probably 90% of people that use Landfire, or if not more, use Esri products. Um, people on the Landfire team actually use QGIS a fair bit and have worked out methods for um, that. And they, they switch back and forth between Esri and QGIS, excuse me. Um, and we're starting to dig into R. More, more and more people are using R. It seems like almost every paper I see now has some mention of R. So um, R, QGIS, and Esri being the main, main tools. And um, there's a great answer uh, in the question and answer section here. From all these questions, AIM data is annually uploaded from the National Operations Center to Land Fire. So thanks for that. Great. Um, an anonymous viewer asks, have any peer-reviewed critical reviews of Landfire been published? Yes. Um, a group out of University of Colorado, um, for example, they compared their locally derived land fuels data with Landfire data. Um, uh, Peter Brown has done some great assessments of the Landfire models. He's a dendro dendrochronologist, fire ecologist, um, super well published, and he's compared the Landfire data sets to his own. And there are more out there. Um, and I've written a white paper on it for the two-hearted area of the Upper Peninsula. There are a number of those papers where we've tried to assess Landfire data against other local data sets, and there are peer-reviewed papers out there. Um, yes, um, Travis asks to follow up on March questions. What type of modeling techniques are you using? Random forest neural nets support vector machines. Um, I know that random forests have been used, and one of the models is called C, as in Clarence 5. Um, we use Landsum for the, the fire modeling, the spatial component of the fire modeling. And um, going on to the remap, they're exploring all sorts of new technologies. Um, I have not heard that the, the mapping team talk about neural nets, for example, but my guess is that they are. Um, so. This, this is a tough question because we don't always have time to document things as much as we want. Um, there are, there's Rollins 2009 is probably the best document to peer review document to look into Landfire methods. Landfire.gov has a number of papers on the modeling that was used, but um, you know, our, our staff just are not paid to, to document as much as they would like. But so, Anyways, random forest, yes. C5, yes. Land sum, yes. Um, ST sim, yes, on the modeling. Any other questions? These are, these are great. And um, I, I wish I was like the authority. I could probably say I'm the authority on modeling in the Great Lakes, but Landfire is just too huge to know it all. Um, and if you have anything you want to dig into more, um, well, feel free, of course, to do it on your own. But I would love to be CC'd on your emails or um, learn what you, what you find. Thanks, Randy. I'll jump in one last time and point you toward the bulletins and postcards. Um, that's an, you know, that's a pearl. Uh, if you would like to subscribe to the Landfire Bulletin, it comes out every other month and we send out postcards as we have news, drop me a line at landfire at tnc.org and let me know you want to subscribe and I'll send you the link to do that. Perfect. I'd Great. like to ask Mark to launch the polls right now. For those viewers that have stuck with us, I really appreciate um, all the excellent questions and I appreciate you staying engaged throughout this awesome a really informative talk. Randy, you did a great job of synthesizing this project and this program. Um, and uh, I think you provided a lot of wonderful resources and certainly things I'm going to look into um, here in Utah. So thanks again. Thanks, Jeannie, for contacting me and suggesting Randy. Thanks, Mark, as always. And please take your poll, the poll, um, the quick poll that just launched and help us evaluate our Learn at Lunch webinar program so we can continually improve it and yeah, better. Yeah, the, the poll is up now, so uh, we need to say something interesting for another minute or so, so folks will stay on and do the poll. 
Uh, Randy, I'm curious about, uh, have you worked with Shane Brandt any at uh, university? I think he's at New Hampshire. He's uh, sort of a friend of eExtension.org, and he does a lot of mapping, uh, story mapping and those kinds of things. Ah, you know what? I have not worked with him directly, though. Um, okay. We've toyed around with some story maps, and um, I'm definitely going to, I'll look him up. You said New Hampshire? Yeah, he's it. In fact, I'll um, I'll send you his, his contact. In fact, I'll, I'll sort of do an e bite maybe and uh, copy him and maybe provide a link to the the learning event in this recording. He might find it um, interesting. But he does a lot of uh, the the story map. He uses a lot of the Esri tools, and he's using the uh, is it is it ArcGIS Online? I think is their new online tool. Yeah, that would be it for story mapping. Yep. I would love pretty to see robust. Yeah, it's pretty robust and some pretty neat stuff. And he's, he's done a lot of work with using data like you guys have got, drop it in Esri, create your maps there. And then that sort of last step is creating these, these user stories, these story maps that, that you can sort of share uh, during webinars like these and just share with the general public. Very cool. That's cool. I would like to look into that. Yeah. Okay. Alrighty. So we've got, uh, we've got, yeah, about uh, 63 of 70 folks have voted. So I think we've, we've probably got uh, a good representative from our poll. So I'm going to go ahead and end that now. In fact, real quick, I'll share, share the results so everyone should be able to see that if you're just curious about that. So again, I put a link to the Learn event inside chat. It'll be available there. As Megan mentioned, the recording will also be available on their YouTube channel. Uh, it'll take me a day or two to process that video and get it posted. So if there's nothing else, I want to thank everyone and uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. Bye. -bye. Thanks everyone. Bye.